the topic is gaming, and I thought it would be fun uh, to bring my first game. So this was when I grew up gaming. So this is a really exciting, challenging game. Uh, uh, it's uh, you have to uh, direct frogs from one end to the pond to the other, and you can operate a leaf with these two buttons. So this was gaming back in the day. Uh, the gaming industry, of course, has uh <laughs> progressed tremendously since uh, then. It's now a huge business. Uh, so we thought, well, we invite a game designer, not just any game designer. It's one whose games are played by over 6 million people. Forbes put him on their 30 under 30 list. And he's really stoked because he met Tim Cook this week. <laughs> So he's not your ordinary Candy Crush guy. He designs experimental games where people are motivated or challenged out of their comfort zone to hold hands, dance. You saw me already in the back. He's really good at that, getting you out of your zone to, to dance and move around. Um, so I'm really interested to hear uh, his story. He will talk about game design and um, basically talk about how to make your own kind of games, how to make them really good, and also how to make enough money by doing this. Not unimportant. Adrian de Jong, young, talented, and I hope he will also demonstrate his signature dance for us today. <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to the stage, Adrian. <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, is there, so who of you are students? I'm just wondering. Nearly all of you, good. So this, this talk is really about trying to give you guys some tips and tools for if you are going to be entering the game industry um, that, you can, that you have some handles to, to work with. So uh, yeah, my name is Adrian de Jong. I am a game designer. I am best known for a couple of games. Yeah, de Jong. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, I'm best known for this guy. This is um, this is called this is Fingal. It's basically a game. Two people put a hand on an iPad and they have to like rub each other's fingers, and it's like really awkward and sweaty and nasty. And that's totally wha how we designed it to be. Um, yeah, like millions of people have played this around the world. Um, I've had some like super interesting stories about this. Like a couple of people they used it as like a flirting tool, so they went to a bar, like picked up some dudes or chicks using the game and like end up in bed. And I, I even heard about this person who has a Fingal baby, which is insane if you think about it. Um, but yeah, like I think the sister of my best friend, she had a relationship with this one guy, but that she played Fingal with this other person. And now she broke up with the, her current boyfriend and now has a relationship with a new person. Anyway, lots of interesting stuff happening in that area around Fingal. Um, yeah, interesting, weird things happening around that. Uh, another game I, 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 I developed was uh, Bounden, um, which is a mobile dancing game. So two people, they hold each end of the phone, and the phone tells them how to dance together. Um, this was made in collaboration with the Dutch National Ballet because I needed choreography for this, like actual dance moves, and I know nothing about dancing except like this stupid signature dance. Um, so yeah, they like this is actual the Dutch. This is so these are actually two dancers from the Dutch National Ballet doing like one of their choreographies. Um, this was so Fingal and Bounden I made together with a studio, a game oven we were called, um, which I actually closed down uh, last year of April uh, because of various reasons. I will not go into that. It wasn't necessarily mon a money reason, but also a creative reason. Like collaborating with people is difficult. You guys probably know this. Um, I'm currently collaborating with one other illustrator who has this style. It's like really cool. It's this black and white, where's Wool, where's Wooly, where's Waldo kind of style. And so I saw his work and I thought, I want to make a game with you. And I literally told him this, sort of jokingly told him that. And uh, he was like, yeah, okay, sure. So here we are making a game called Hin Folks, which is like an interactive version of Where's Wooly. So you, you press the 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 hole and you start digging it out and then key comes out and then you can use the key to open the shed and something com comes out of the shed etc cetera, etc cetera. it's like pretty simple plain fun so something that I've been thinking about a lot recently is how the hell does this happen to me right 
So this is Tim Cook. He's the CEO of Apple. I don't know if you guys know Apple. It's like the biggest company in the world. Um, this was two days ago. I met him at the Burst from Berlage where, where he was giving a talk. I was actually invited by Apple to be there and I had no idea. I would like I hoped I would meet Tim Cook, but they actually like scheduled me to talk to him for half an hour. Like what the f that's insane. It's mind blowing to me. And I I don't know, this was like a huge big deal. So I over the past year I've been wondering like how the hell did this happen to me? Like what have I what have I done that this happens to me, right? I what? I'm so what is it that I what I that I'm doing that works? Like what is it that that I do that I can make enough money doing all this weird shit and also like m hang out with Tim Cook. Um, and I think like there's this giant disclaimer that's that I'm going to give you right now. Like there's no recipe for success. Everyone knows this. I cannot tell you like if you do A, B, and C, this is how it, like you'll be famous and rich. Um, so I'm going to be primarily talking about things that have sort of worked for me and like the the ideas behind some things and maybe there's something in there that might work for you maybe there isn't um, and in that case I'm sorry but I think there'll be something in there so I want to start talking to you today about an anecdote about um, about how I got into basically being a game designer because when I was a student I did the HKU uh, Utrecht School of the Arts maybe you guys know it HKU I studied game design and development and for the first two years there, I thought I was going to be an artist. Now, I, I laugh at myself saying that because I am like a terrible artist. Like, give me a pen and I will draw you the ugliest thing you've ever seen. Um, so I slowly realized this as I was um, like progressing through the courses. And so then I finally did my internship knowing that I was not going to be an artist. I was going to be a game designer because Everyone can think, right? Conceptual game design or something. Um, so I went to W Games, which is now called Vanguard. There are 45 people studio in Amsterdam, uh, quite big. Back in the day, they had like a six or seven person game design team. Like a bunch of people sitting behind computers uh, writing in some their own Wikipedia about like uh, uh, the game they were making, like a game design document. Um, and so I was, I was you know, joining them uh, into doing that, writing down texts in a wiki. Um, but there was one person there um, who would inspire me and like seriously influence me for the rest of my life. This person was Kent Cunet. Uh, he was one of, my one of the other game designers there. And um, there was one particular thing that he did that no of the other game designers did, which was he would come in the morning to work, but he would then show a prototype that he made the previous evening that he made in Unity that he taught himself like in the last month or so and uh, it would be like something completely different every time like oh look I made this kite surfing game or yeah I was interested in the crowd simulation so I made a thing yesterday this entire thing I made last night and it's a about crowd simulation or like I was I made a multiplayer game in, a, in an evening so Lots of stuff that he made that I, that really inspired me. So he was like making prototypes. I didn't really knew what it meant back then, but he showed me what it meant. And so what one day he did was make a prototype of the main character. And again, like we were a game design team and we're all just typing text, right? Nobody was writing any code or like making the actual game. All the game designers were writing text, but he now finally made a prototype he made a prototype of the main character. And when that happened, the entire studio, like literally 45 people, like stood, stood behind him on his computer while he's playing it, all basically discussing what they thought was, was terrible about it, what really worked, what didn't, how it felt, and like all these things that suddenly the entire studio had something specific, something concrete to talk about, something that they could look at and see What's wrong about this? What what works? Some they had something real to talk about. So the entire studio came alive because of the fact that he made an actual prototype. So I learned a couple things from this that have been like super, super, super important for me as being a game designer. The first thing is that 
I've truly started to believe that prototyping, which means like making a hacky, shitty version of the actual idea that you have, <laughs> is actually also a form of explaining to other people what you have in mind. So having like something playable and interactive um, can help you like transfer your ideas to other people. Um, you can say what works and what doesn't, right? Um, and also you can use this to sort of set expectations, but maybe that's not, uh, not as important for you at this stage right now. Um, the thing is like there's this saying in English which says a picture says more than a thousand words. I, th I honestly think like a prototype says more than 10,000 words because uh, a prototype can be interactive, right? You can actually do something with it and then the, the state of the game would change. So um <coughs> I honestly believe like ideas are really cheap. Everyone has ideas all the time. If we if you will sit down right now for five minutes, I bet you can uh, can come up with like ten really terrible maybe ideas, but you can get come up with ten ideas. And so like it for me it's not the idea that matters, but always the execution. And that's really what you can do uh, with a prototype. And this actually became way more apparent later on in my career where, for instance, recently, instead of giving someone else like a concept document about this thing I wanted to pitch to him, I literally gave him a prototype and a, a small list of everything that I thought was wrong about it. And then they played the prototype and were completely convinced about the fact that I was able to make this game. Because not because I told them I was able to, but because I could actually show them what I had in mind. So yeah, a prototype says way more and functions really as a language uh, when it comes to trying to transfer your ideas. So another thing, this is actually sort of, this has been paramount in my, in my um, career. If you want to do actual game design, I honestly believe that you need to be the one being able to code your own ideas. So back in the day, it used to be, especially in AAA, that game designers were like conceptual thinkers, were the people that were writing the documents. But now, if I look back at that, I think that's a ridiculous thought because there's so much you as a game designer cannot know about if you don't do the actual implementation yourself. Um, because a lot of game designers leave the implementation to the programmer, right? And I think that's, that's ridiculous because the thing with being able to implement yourself is also the fact that if you do that, then you always continuously reflect <coughs> on what you're implementing. So it's really about the trying, trying whether something works and seeing if it actually works. And this is, I think, what, it, what, is, what it is I call game design, just making something and seeing whether it works. And if it doesn't, you throw it away. Or if it does, you keep it and maybe you keep refining it. So if you want to be a game designer, I have one giant pro tip for you. Just learn to code. This is going to be, throughout your entire career, one of the best things you've ever done. Just as a reference, it took me three months to learn how to code. Three months. That is not an enormous amount of time. So do it, all right? Okay, let's continue. If you're able to make your own prototypes, if you're able to code, then you can start making all your weird ideas. This is something I literally did. Um, you can just sit down, come up with a bunch of ideas, pick the best one, and make it. And you can do this in the span of a day, right? One, you can lose one day to just make a weird prototype and maybe something weird will happen. Um, honestly, like this is an actual thing I think about. Like a lot of people often tell me, oh, you're so creative. And then I think about, I think about them as being like, well, if, you're, if that's the way you think about it, then of course you're not creative because you think it's a sort of an ability that you have or that you don't have. But I honestly think that being creative is a mentality in which you know that if you come up with a lot of stuff, 90% of it is going to be like plain shit. 90% of what you are you come up with is wrong or doesn't work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So recognizing that means you could just go into this weird mode. And that's what I actually called, well I call it the fuck it mode. I go into this mode all the time. It basically means I'd sit down and I just come up with the like the, sh the weirdest shit I've ever thought of. And I if there's, 
it's very likely that after like an hour of coming up with all this weird stuff, which you can literally like keep writing because like if, if you don't give a damn, if you're like in fuck it, you can just write down everything you have in mind, right? And I can guarantee you after an hour of doing this, you have like 50 ideas and there might be actually one idea in there that might work or something. And like this is, this is so effective. This works every time for me. So um, for me, this resulted in one of the first games um, um, actually, so one I one weird idea for me really stuck, and that's the game that became the the finger rubbing game, right? So there might actually be value to all your weird ideas, and especially if you can make them yourself. So next thing, once you have these weird ideas and you've actually tried to make some of these things, um, what I do is I take design very seriously. So I don't know if anyone ever explained the difference between art and design to you, whereas in art, most people just go wild because they want to, and they just create because they want to, whereas in design, there's always this sort of goal or idea that people want to reach. And what I do is, thi I set this goal to be a vision, and that means to be like a feeling or like an experience I have in mind for people. This is probably something all of you have heard of before when you, when you like go to game design school or whatever. Um, so what I do is I try to design everything, all the this individual components of a video game um, to be like, to adhere to this vision. So that would be the visuals, the level, the music, the sounds. So in case of the finger rubbing game, for instance, I wanted people to feel really awkward in touching each other's hands. So what did I do? I introduced bow chica wow wow music because that's like this warm, sweaty feeling. I had these uh, 70s wallpaper, like the red, orange tints because that's like really intimate. And there was only like two or three sounds in the game. And I think they were like, oh, like these really nasty breathing stuff, like everything in the game. And of course the levels where I made people do all these weird like finger intertwining exercises. Everything in the game was always entirely about trying to make people feel really awkward about intertwining each other's hands. So everything I made in this game was all about that. But there's something I sort of really s uh, quickly skipped over, which is actually I think for me that has been the biggest thing for me is that I've also thought about game mechanics in this sense. And if nearly all of you think about games right now and game mechanics, you'll probably be thinking about first-person shooters, RPGs, top-down action games, platformers, bullet hell, I don't know. There's, there's like a couple conventions in game mechanics that everyone is using. And let me really... Um, Take this a little bit further. This is getting a little bit technical, um, but I, I do want you to understand this because this is something that a lot of game designers don't even think about. They sort of take the input and the game mechanics for granted. So this is what I see, what I define as a game mechanic. There's a physical input that the player does. There's something in between, an abstraction, something to help you get to the in-game event. So one example would be a shooter. You have the mouse, for instance. You have the mouse. If you move the mouse to the left, there's the concept. So I physically move the mouse to the left. There's the concept of rotating your head or something. And then in the game, there's a camera that rotates in a, an arbitrary way, right? So how are the physical movement of moving your camera or moving your hand uh, related to the um, rotation of the camera in the game? They are not at all. So that's why you have the abstraction. So a shooter has that. Um, platformers, you have like the press left arrow key, which then represents making a character walk in a virtual space to the left. So point and click games, you have like a mouse. You can also, like if you move a mouse on this surface, a pointer will move on a different surface, up and down and left and right. And then if you click on the mouse button, you click on something and something else might happen in the game. These are the game mechanics. They're always tied to the actual physical inputs of the player. So in order for you to understand 
how I feel about game mechanics and why I think most game designers do not think about this, I want to talk to you about a game that I heard about through Twitter. Maybe you guys know Bennett Foddy. He I Bennett Foddy is the maker of a game called Quop. Who knows Quop? Ah, most people are like, yeah, that stupid, silly game where you control individual muscles of like an athlete and you try to make him run, but then like you try to make him run like this and he trips over and it's super funny. Um, so anyway, Bennett told me about this game called Pancake. It's a game on iOS and uh, basically what you have to do is you, it's on your phone. If you hold the screen, you put your finger on the screen, a pancake, uh, actually the pan goes up and if the pancake is on top of it, it will fly up. And if you release uh, the screen, the pan will go down. It's a very simple game. Uh, and what you have to do is try to flip the pancake as much as you can. Now, I have a lot of expertise in pancake flipping. And I can tell you that this game actually has barely anything to do with the actual <laughs> experience of pancake flipping. Um, so if I would make this game, and I, I would also try to look at the game mechanics, and I would make game mechanics that work like this. Right? So what's happening here? The physical input that I'm doing is the exact same as, what as the physical input that I would be doing uh, if I were to actually hold a pan and uh, try to flip a pancake. Um, and maybe you can even like like flip it up and maybe you can like try to catch the pancake. I don't know. Um, so that would be a different game mechanic, right? In one example, you would be touching the screen and you would like base the pan would like make this upward movement and you would release it and it would go down. That's the game mechanic. Here, the game mechanic would be actually flipping something. So as you can, as you might imagine, um, that's much of a closely, mo more closely related experience to the actual vision, right? If you want m people to understand what pancake flipping is all about. Now, here's the, here's the little trick. I'm not saying that like this game would be a better game at all. I'm just saying that it would be more true to the actual experience of pancake flipping. And I think a lot of you game designers can do the exact same thing, where if you have a vision for a game that you, ca that you can and that you should be looking for game mechanics that fit with this very specific vision that you have in mind. Um, so what I'm saying here is that I think you should dare to invent your own game mechanics because sometimes this will enable you to make way better experiences, way more true to the, to the, to the actual vision that you have. Um, if you're interested in this, I don't know, like, I don't know much about how this process works because it's, I haven't done it enough. Like, I've done it for three or four games and those have prov proven to be sort of working well. Um, but what I usually do now is if I have a vision, like an experience I have in mind, I think about all the inter just interactions that happen. Not necessarily like between a person and a computer, but like actual interactions. So if people would dance, for instance, they would hold hands, they would move their feet, they would look at each other, they would swing each other, they would lift each other. I don't know, there's a lot of interactions that happen in dancing, and I bet that if you can find a technology and like put it in between this interaction, that maybe you can make a game out of that. That's literally what I did with the mobile dancing game that I showed you guys uh, at the start. So, um, so yeah, I think, so this, up till this point, I think everything I talked about is about 50% of the reason that I met Tim Cook two days ago, right? 50%. So I want to talk about the other 50% as well. And I think this really applies to everyone and all of you, even if you're not interested in doing marketing or business or blah, 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 any of it, this is still extremely, extremely, extremely important. Because so, again, making a good game takes way more than just making a good game. Um, and I also want to call this like the, the student barriers to becoming sustainable. Because this is just the, the following points I will be addressing are really the things that I can see nearly all students always doing wrong from the start. And I, I always point people towards these things, but they just it, it seems like they never learn. So here's some super valuable stuff that you should just really take 
don't take for granted, work on this. Okay, so the first thing about talking about your game, showing it to other people, is playtesting. This is like the primary tool for games, uh, game designers. You guys have probably heard this before if you've ever done any sort of game design course. Um, and you I also won't be the first one to tell you, do this as soon as possible. I always do this after day one. One. One day, people, after the first day that you've made your, uh, your prototype, this is what you do, playtesting. I'll tell you why. This is the main reason. You don't know all of your game's problems. You just don't. You can come, if you like, if you make something, you can stare at it for hours and try to think of all the things that are wrong with it. But the confrontation of putting it in front of someone else and him playing it, his first two questions, you would never have thought about that. You would never have known. You, could, you couldn't know unless you saw 20 people play your game. So giant pro tip here, take every playtesting opportunity that you can get. Every, every single playtesting opportunity. Your mom is a great playtester. Your little brother is a great playtester. The person sitting right next to you is a great playtester. Yeah, them too. Exactly. Yeah, she is, sure. Um, what I do is I go to a lot of events. I go to meetups. I go to festivals. I go to conferences. I go to a lot of places. Um, and even if you don't want to go to any of these places, I recommend you just set up your own opportunities. Like, make it simple, make it informal. If you're still at school, like, just sit in the lobby and ha ask a random person, hey, do you, like, want to play my game for 10 minutes? You'll get so much valuable information from that. I can guarantee you that. And if you focus on all the things that are stopping them from having the experience that you want to, then you know exactly what to work on. And honestly, like, I believe s so hard in this that if I would, for instance, make a film, I don't know if you guys know anything about filmmaking, but normally the filmmaking process is someone writes a script for like four months and then like a producer says yes or no, and then money happens, and then they make the film. I would never make a film li uh, like that. What I would do is I would literally take up my phone, I would make the film, like a shitty version of it, a prototype, and then I would show it to people and ask them their opinions. I would literally try to play test the film as well. So I think like play testing doesn't isn't just for games, it's for anything. You don't know your games or your product's problems, so why not just take every opportunity to try to play test it? Okay. While we're at the subject of play testing, I also believe, strongly believe, that you can play test everything but the game as well. So I don't know if you, you guys have ever like tried to tell about your game's idea to someone else. That is a pitch, whether you want it or not. And the thing is, if you do a pitch a thousand times, you will learn something about the way you talk about it. For instance, and this is a funny anecdote, the first time I showed Fingal at a conference, uh, so the finger rubbing game, I would, n I would start with saying, hey, I made a game about finger rubbing, do you want to play? And most people were like, <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> and then what I started doing is like refining that message, that pitch. And then I would say, hey, I, might, I made a weird little game. Do you want to try? And they sh they're like, sure, let's do this. And then they find each other finger up and be like, ah! And that's exactly the, the sort of experience I wanted to have. And there's something valuable to that. Because if I then continue to make, I don't know, screenshots for in the App Store, I should not make it too clear that this is going to be the most awkward game they've ever played, right? So uh, that's, that taught me something. And that might happen for your game as well. There might be subtle differences that you need to be aware of that are important for you to also talk about your game. See what sticks. Ask them questions. But also see, after you've done your pitch, what questions do, pe do other people have for you so that you can, next time if you give a pitch, just tell them exactly what the previous person also wanted to know about your game. Make it short. See when they laugh, etc. So this is a thing you can do. But here's the thing, most, of, most people here, and probably a bunch of you guys here as well, if they, if they hear the word marketing, they go like, marketing, Ugh, it's terrible. It's, uh. And you know, I, I used to be one of those people as well, where I was like, uh, marketing, yeah, you need to like sell your soul to the devil, right? Um, 
But honestly, I found that that's just not true. That's basically how ad agencies look at it, all right? Don't work for ad agencies. Um, my style is just sharing my excitement. So if I make a game and I'm really excited about it, then all I have to do is find a way to also make you excited about it. And I'll just try to tell you everything that I'm excited about, and maybe you'll also be excited. And it's really that simple. Um, so funny thing is that I talk about my games in a very ener energized way because, because I'm really excited. Um, and that's really what marketing means for me. Um, but I, I'm, I must be very clear that I taught myself this. Like, there's a lot of people that if I tell them this, the first thing they'll say is, yeah, well, you're an extrovert. And yeah, you're very good in like all these social things. And I'm like, well, that's fucking bullshit. I was like bullied for four years on my g um, it, while I was like in high school or something. And I literally went from zero, zero social to being like super excited to people and outgoing and open. So you can learn this, you know? So if all of you are like, well, I'm really not the kind of marketing person, you know, stop creating that barrier for yourself. Just go out there. Talk to some people. Transfer your excitement. Are, if you're excited about what you're making, then talk about it to other people exactly in that way. Okay, so just do it, all right? Super big pro tip. Good. All those people grabbing for their phones, being like, got to write this down. Good. Just do it, you know? All right. Next thing. Networking. Another word that excites. No that disgusts most students. Uh, networking, do I have to like go to all these boring events with people with suits, uh, suits. Um, to me, networking is literally making new friends. So I go to probably more, more than six international events a year. I go to GDC, I, can, I go to PAX E, sometimes I go to E3, um, and I go to like some European little festivals and all I do is like hang out with people that are that are there, like literally hanging out. Sometimes those people happen to be editorial manager of the app store in the US. Well, <laughs> what do you know? And I, of course, then just talk about all the weird shit that I've been making and it works. And that's li really what networking is. Like I just hang out with a bunch of people and be like, hey, how are you? Yeah, how are, wha what are you doing these days? Like I'm, I'm interested and because I'm interested, they'd be interested in me. And that's, I don't know, I feel I have friends all over the world uh, and some of them just happen to be influential in a way. And I, I don't really use them. I just try to help them, you know, if there's something they're making that I'm that I think is really cool, I'll share it on Twitter, I'll share it on Facebook, I'll share it wherever I can. I introduce this person to this Apple guy I met, I'll introduce this person to the Sony person I met. And apparently that's what networking is, just hanging out with your friends and introducing everyone else. So networking is not a disgusting thing, guys. You have to realize this, it's just, it's super fun, have a bunch of friends and you hang out, it's super fun. Um, yeah, so this is really a giant pro tip. Like, networking is nothing more than just helping each other out and being sort of part of the community through that. Um, so yeah. All right. <coughs> here's a here's a strange general truth that I believe um, that I truly believe in maybe a bit provocative I'm already sorry about it but honestly nobody knows what the fuck they're doing <laughs> um, in t especially in terms of business a lot of people have ideas about where the world is going or a lot of people have ideas about like how things work and how to be successful and if you go to like this um, there's this website called Gama Sutra which is like the, the it's not Gama Sutra no stop laughing Gamma Sutra with a G. It's like where all the industry people talk about like their success and talk about how they think things work. And you read like postmortems about like what works and what doesn't. And it it gives you the illusion that there are people that know how stuff works. But I honestly think like that it 
everything you do is so contextual. It's so, it's so important to realize everything that's around it. It's too complicated for anyone to comprehend. So if you ever get advice from anyone, realize this and think about it. Don't tell them this, of course, because you'll have a very nasty conversation. But this is definitely something you have to be thoughtful of uh, at all times. Because, you know, business things, they change all the time. If someone tells you, yeah, you can make a thousand, hundred thousand dollars on Steam if you just put it there. That used to be the case two years ago. Now it's not. So how are you going to make money? iOS, the same thing. 2,000 games come out every day. How do you make money? And there's all these people that tell you how to do it. And uh, I, I'm just, maybe I'm too skeptical or too realistic about this. But people just don't know how that sort of stuff works. And this is actually the reason that today I'm here talking about talking to you about these sorts of things instead of, instead of like giving you all these hints about, oh, well, Twitch right now is a big thing because streamers and like um, viewers, they can interact now because of the Steam API. Like I could tell you a thousand of these things that, that I think that are interesting to think about in terms of business, in terms of like getting more customers or making better games, but I'm not because I don't want to be that person telling you, um, well, this is how business in the world works and this is how you make money because I, I genuinely don't believe that that's something that anyone can really do and get something useful out of. So the thing I do is I go to a lot of people and I ask a lot of advice about business. Um, I just talk about it. So I go to like any random person, I say, here's this game I have. Do you think it would make sense for it, for this to ask like five bucks on on the app store? And then they might say yes or no. And we can have a discussion about how he feels about it or how she feels about it. Um, and all like all these thoughts and all these suggestions, they grow into some cloud that just get help me like feed my intuition, right? And eventually I have to make this the decision myself. But knowing about all these opportunities and knowing about all these small little steps that I could take that could me that could help you decide whether you want to go to Sony and when there's even an opportunity. Do you know about the Sony Pub Fund? Oh, you should apply for this fund over here. You know, there's a lot of people that know a lot of stuff. Um, you should like try to grab something from all of these people and then make your own decision. This has been super, 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 super important to me. And I think this is almost the other 50% um, of me meeting Cook, Tim Cook two days ago. Because if I look back at all the people who have who have given me business advice and all the people that have helped me um, realize what my opportunities were, what, my, what all the paths were that I could take, um, it's a giant list. It's a giant, giant list. And all these people have contributed a little part into helping me understand what I could do at all. And then I made the decision myself to just go, in all the, go into all these paths. And then I'd be talking, for instance, about Rami Ismail, uh, one of the people behind Flumbeer. He's giving me a lot of business advice. Uh, my dad is giving me a lot of business advice. Literally, like, random people I met at GDC, like a game developer conference, people with like who've never made a successful game gave me sometimes better ideas than like all the the big CEOs who have made millions and millions of dollars. So everyone has like their ideas and you just pluck from everyone, right? Everyone's always willing to give their opinion. Um, so I could literally today give you a hundred more tips, but I only have like 45 minutes. Um, so I really want to go through a couple of them quickly. These are like subjects that you can like, you should write them down and think about them. Maybe if you want to be a game designer and want to think about creative processes and making enough money. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have like a, a, a long anecdote for it. One thing I've been doing a lot is focusing on the scalable. Okay, what does that mean? If you are, uh, if you run a bakery, and you want to make money, the only way to do that is by baking a single bread and then selling that single bread. It's very simple. And if you want to, ma if you want to scale up from one bread, you can uh, make 100 breads, and then you can sell 100 breads. Now, fortunately for us in the game industry, you can make one game and sell millions of copies, millions. But you can also sell zero. 
isn't that exciting? <laughs> um, and this like thought really drives me. It, it, it drives me to like take every little route I can because I don't know whether I'll make zero or a million copies. But the thing is that most people often don't really think about their work that way. So for instance, say you get paid to give a talk. I don't know, like you get a hundred bucks somewhere for you to give a, a talk. And now you you want to like make a living out of that. You need to give 30 talks. <laughs> Holy shit. But yeah, th there's no other way. I need to give 30 talks. It's the same as baking a bread, right? Giving talks is the same as baking bread. It's not scalable. Um, but then you can invest all your time into making something that you might make a million of, make a million out of. And I think that in the long run, that will pay off more. You'll learn more, you'll invest more, you'll be more motivated. So this is like, for me, this is a huge subject um, that I'm only like, I'm giving you a little piece of this. Maybe you can also be inspired by this. Um, something else that I found. I used to run a, g a game studio, right? Um, together with one other guy, and we had a couple people working for us. And what I found was, if people are not invested into it, if they don't sort of own a part of the product, a part of the game, if they don't feel like, if I'm gonna do my utter best, I'm gonna see a giant return, like, I can make a million out of this. Like, if you don't give people that feeling, they will make slightly different nuanced uh, choices in what they are gonna do. And one example of that is, I used to work with a bunch of illustrators and artists that would make really pretty art, but sometimes it would be like just off. And I, I'm not an artist, I don't know how to make it better, um, but it would be just off. And I could tell them this, and they'd be like, well, you know, too bad, it's just off, it's good enough, you know? And good enough is really not good enough for me, and I will like hate it forever, and I'll be like, ah, and we'll hire someone else to do it better, you know? That's really what would happen. But if that person was invested, if I would collaborate with this other person, if this other person would share, say, 10% of the profit, then that person would look at the stuff that's just off, would throw it out, and would make it new entirely. And so with the game Hidden Folks, the Where's Wooly game that I'm making, what I'm seeing is we spent together probably four months full time on the game. There was the first level we made, we spent six days on it, which is a considerable amount of time, right? It's like six days of sitting down, doing the actual thing. Two months ago, he and I discovered that that thing we made that took us six days doesn't work. From my perspective, perspective, I'm like, well, you know, this got to go out. But I can't just tell him that because he spent six days on it. So what happens is we talk about it and he concludes that the level needs to go out. And this makes this this makes me melt, right? Like this is the, the exact sort of collaboration that I've always wanted. Someone who is as invested as I am in making the best fucking thing he's ever made in his life. And that's the sort of people you have to work with. That's the sort of people that you have to surround yourself with because then all of you will really help each other become better at everything and make a better game. And that's all inside this word collaborate. Wor working for someone doesn't just do the same thing, all right? It's subtle nuances. Maybe some of you will disagree with me on this, but I found this to be true. So at least think about it, I suggest. Okay, a couple more super practical ones. I made this website called Do Contract, and if you're ever like m making a game with other people and you want to like talk about who owns the rights or who can like, who gets how much money for anything. Um, you need some sort of an agreement. You can do it like through email or whatever, but believe me, there's just tons of stuff that you haven't thought about, ex especially the first couple times that you're making an agreement. So I collected a bunch of agreements from other game developers. I made something out of it, which is like a, ge a generic form. You can just literally fill in on the left who it is you're working with, what kind of agreement you want to, you can negotiate everything. And on the right, you have the agreement and it's free and 
especially nice if you can't afford like paying a thousand dollars to a lawyer to give you something that that's uh, that is really expensive and that but also works for you so if you're as cheapskate as i am use this thing that's basically what i'm saying um something that also might really help you in getting the word out but also knowing where to get the word out uh promoter app I, I think the app is actually called promoter has this festival calendar which is extremely 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 convenient because you can see all the deadlines for all the cool international festivals all of them so if you ever want to submit anything to any festival this is where you have to uh go to and just subscribe to your google calendar it's super easy okay general tip the the i am a true workaholic because i absolutely love what i do i'm i love making games i go home in the evenings and i continue making games there's not a lot of people that can say the same thing about their job i just really love it some people will consider this working real hard for me it's like uh, modi operandus it's like that's just the way i i do these things but i must also say that it's also very important to balance this with like a healthy lifestyle i have a timer on my computer which goes off every half hour um, and it forces me to get off the computer for a minute and what do i do i think about oh how uh, my legs are a bit stiff or oh i need to drink or i need to go to the bathroom if i don't have that timer i will easily sit down behind the computer for five hours and at the end of five hours feel like shit be really sore everywhere um, um, and sort of be m mentally drained so this one minute every half an hour really makes sure that i get a little bit more exercise i think about me and my body and i don't get a burnout i've had two burnouts i can tell you it's not fun i'm 25 years old i've had two burnouts it's not fun don't do it all right so do not ignore your health eat well sleep well exercise well do it exercise throughout the day you know i i don't want to be giving you these hints but a lot of people need these hints you know to like have some sort of handle so yeah don't ignore your health i found out i think about five years ago about the difference of the difference between passion and ambition nobody told me this before but when someone told me this i realized that i've been in the wrong camp for a long time ambition is like having this really long-term plan having this long-term idea that you're working towards which can really drive you to to make bigger ambitious projects that's where the word fits in really well but you cannot do any of this when you're not enjoying the actual thing the passion for the minute to minute things so what i when i realized this that i was more ambitious than i was passionate i started to look for more fun into the actual doing i started to enjoy programming more i started to enjoy playtesting more when people were telling me which things were shit about my game i started enjoying collaborating with other people more the production the marketing i started enjoying a lot more things when i realized that i wasn't gonna get through an entire project when i did not love the minute to minute thing that i was doing so this is a thing you should think about and if you're ever making something try to enjoy it the minute for minute things okay this is the end the last slide i want to say a couple more things because i had a bunch i've had probably more than 20 interns over the past five years and um i think the sort of conclusion that i've drawn from what they've been saying to me what they've learned from me is that it's not the people who only make good games that in the end make enough money to sustain themselves to keep doing what they love because it's the people that care about the rest too the people that are not afraid to play test and the people that are not afraid to do the marketing and the business and the networking it's the ones that find a way to make things work make things work the way they want to to be able to do what they love uh, and they get there because they sought hard and they took the initiative and they went for it they just dove in and they found a way 
Thank you for listening. No, it's not on yet. Is there any questions? This person. Okay, let's let's do it like this. I'll repeat. So. Yeah. Uh, oh wow. Now I'm on, but we need Adrian on. <laughs> so I'll hello, just repeat hello. the yeah, question while we, we wait. Yeah. Repeat the question. Yes. The tips Tim Cook gave you. So Tim Cook is a a business guy beyond reason. So the things he told me after I played finger with him <laughs> and danced with him. Um, was obviously related to, oh, well, are you using like 3D touch? Or um, how are you doing in the uh, markets uh, in China? Or like he was really thinking about my weird stuff um, in terms of how can you make it more businessy, right? How can you use, how can we tie you to Apple even more? Oh, you're using Unity, which is great for multi-platform, but please start using our proprietary Swift that only works on iOS. You know, that's the sort of feedback he gave me, which is understandable. Um, and I guess that's also the reason why he's like a CEO of the biggest company in the world. Yeah. So any other questions? Yeah. Yes. I will now go over with a working awesome. mic. You're afterwards. And so uh, did you enjoy it. your pizza? Whoa. And be careful. I'm still enjoying it. <laughs> Great. Awesome right, um, pizza. How do you keep an eye on the scope of a project? How do you make it not too big uh, as features and stuff? Right. I would make it as small as you can every time. Just as tiny little as possible. Um, that's what I've done and that has enabled me to keep project lengths really small um, and, make, and make them doable basically, make them practical. Um, so If you are making a game, you obviously like have an idea of what you want, like a sort of vision. If you ex if you can extrapolate the experience out of that, and just make what is barely necessary for m for making that experience really good, focus on making that. If you have that, you already have a game, and if you want to extend that, then that would be a possibility even afterwards. So that's what I have to say about scoping. I don't think there's necessarily like a very robust way I could tell, yeah, you have to like finish this thing after two months or finish that thing after four months then. It, that's just not how it works. But I, what, I, what I can tell you, one more th little thing about that. Um, if you play test a lot, you'll know very well when that little thing you've built, whether it works. And so that can also help you understanding how far you are within the scope and understanding your planning. So those are maybe things you can, uh, you can think about. Okay, there was another question somewhere over here. It was you. Yep. Yes. And then afterwards, you guys. Uh, you said that about the marketing. You basically translated to transfer your excitement. Yes. But as in terms of apps and App Store and all those things, uh -huh. you can transmit this. You know, you have to do like a planning of marketing and stuff like that, ad networks and all those stuff. No. Or no, you don't have to. Because when you say transfer excitement, I. I think, oh, I, I'm going to tell my friend and yes. to another friend. But that's exactly but what I'm talking about. it's too small. Isn't Is it, it too small, though? Because oh. if you go to a game developer event, for instance, you go to GDC, so you invest 2,000 euros to fly from the Netherlands to San Francisco. You're there. Everyone around you are influential game developers because they were all able to invest uh, 2,000 euros into getting there. Every single person that you can transfer your excitement to so that they become excite, excited about your game, will maybe even be your community managers. And I'm not saying like literally community managers, but they will be the, the ones that if your game releases, they will be the first ones to tweet about it, to share it on Facebook. They'll be as excited about the game as you are. So if you're able to do that, I think that's super valuable. And the people that I have um, transferred my excitement to can also be journalists. It can also be platform holders. It can be the people uh, that decide who, uh, which apps get placed in the storefront. Because those are the people that I meet there. So, 
yes, I think I definitely think it's it's possible. And yes, maybe it does sound too small, but if I can convince one person that he or she needs to download my game, then maybe I'll also be able to convince all these other people, and maybe they will start convincing other people, who will then start convincing other people. And so, I'm not sure if it's if it's that small. Yeah. Okay, and you never had any costs with marketing? Well, I go to events a lot, oh, and those fine. are my costs. Okay, perfect. But I've never, I've never had ads somewhere, I've never like paid for product placement or any of that. And yet I still make enough money. So there's definitely other ways than, than that. Uh, and yeah, m so my style in that is really trying to share my excitement with everyone because I make weird, shitty games and they're super fun to play. <laughs> so, you know. Okay. Question over there. Question. In the, in oh, the okay, great. Answered. Somewhere. Well, it's, who else la it's ladies first, right? Oh, ladies yeah, first. Sorry. But she, she already <laughs> but had we'll her I'll remember you. She already had her oh, answered qu answer. question answered. Oh, well, it's them. So, oh, so I can go over there. gentleman in the back. Yeah, how are you gonna I'll do move this? Over. this is I hate it. The speaker makes the whole sound go weird. So the singing sound. Yeah, it's there great. you go. Yeah, there was a question talking about costs. Like, if you want to make a game and you have to iterate and you have to test and you have to make your game, that takes time. Yep. And if your game sucks at the end, you invested a lot of time. You could have been working on like actually making money. But what do you? S what? Wait, I don't get what you're saying. If your game sucks in the end. Well, if it depends, like, nobody buys it and you can't make any money of it, but you invested, like, a month of work in that. Like, how do you finance yourself if you're not, like, an awesome game designer? <laughs> <laughs> this is literally... What? <laughs> what the hell? Wow. Okay. But, um, but seriously, that is literally the advice I I, uh, I'm, I'm going to give you. Like, yeah. you have to find a way. Because the people that find a way, they make it. And I'm, I'm serious about that. Like... If people find a way into being able to invest that sort of time into it, say you get a day job and you do it in the evenings and you spend a month that way, or you get a fund somewhere, or you get your dad to give you a loan, that you should not do that. But if you find a way, then then that's the only way you can go forward. So Is yeah. that the way you did it as well? Just find like working a bar or so like getting a loan? Yes. So with Except for the first game I made, which made, like, I think 150,000 euros, which is a lot for, like, your first little game, which makes people finger up. Um, that enabled us to get, like, two years, to have a studio for two years. But after that, we had to s s find other ways of financing. Um, and that made us creative in ways. So Bounden, the game with the Dutch National, that had choreography with the Dutch National Ballet, that actually came together because... The moment I knew I was going to ask the Dutch National Ballet, I also knew that maybe I got a better chance at, get, at getting this game fund uh, subsidy. And we could ask for this amount of money so that we could actually make the game. So we found a way, literally. And um, yeah, knowing about all these different options, again, like th the thing you can do there is just asking a lot of people. Ask a lot of people around you, like, oh, well, how did you fund this game? And how did this studio fund this game? And soon you'll discover that everyone's just, like, hacking their games together um, and, like, doing it a little bit dirty or, like, finding all these strange funding places that you'd never heard of. App Campus was a thing for a while, which was, like, uh, Windows or Microsoft giving money to anyone who would uh, give them uh, a game. And, like, we got, like, 50,000 euros from that one day. We got BBSO subsi subsidies, which is like this weird technical thing. Uh, you uh, you fill in a form and you get like a uh, reduction on uh, on taxes, which is really nice, right? Actually saves you literally thousands of euros. So I don't know. You have to find a way, and it's it's tough, you know. But if you do and you get and you make all these opportunities for yourself to make the stuff you love and you, you that you want to make. I honestly believe that in the end, you'll you'll see a big satisfaction and return from that as well. And it has for me so far. So I hope it also does for you and for the rest of you. So we have time for just one last question. Is there any more questions? There's one question over there. Last question. Oh, so much responsibility. Oh, yeah. Better be the best question of the day. Just kidding. Oh, God. He's <laughs> like, oh, God, I shouldn't ask this. I don't think it'll be the best question, okay. though. <laughs> Give me um, it anyway. 
uh, it's about if uh, when to consider a game complete, so to say. You partially already answered it, but um, for me, kind of relevant. <coughs> yeah. Uh, is I have a game which I got as feedback basically to yeah. have more progression in it. Yeah. And I'm now wondering, so should I like if it's for a mobile game? Right. And maybe it could already be entered. I actually haven't figured out how to do right. that. Right. And should con should I maybe in the first version to keep um, the progression or yeah when it's is it complete yeah How it's a very tough it? and loaded question I think the way I think about it is basically based on two things one how much does the current version of the game make the experience that I have in mind work if, if I give the game to someone else will he experience this and then the second thing is, do I have enough money to actually do this? Um, which is not something you should neglect, right? And so with Bounden, for instance, the mobile dancing game, in truth, like even though it makes people dance and that's already mind-blowing in a way, I think it's also not really a super great game. But that's just all I had to, m all, I, all the time and resources I had to be able to make it. So you need to be very realistic in, in when it's done. And um, yeah, it's I don't I cannot give you like a, a oh this when this happens it's done congratulations Poof. store done you know that's just not how it works so um, yeah all the feedback I can give you is shove it, it in people's faces as much as you can distract as much information from that try to iterate based on that and when it's time to release it's time to release I all the games you've seen here today. Um, except for the hidden folks one, have been made in four or five months. That is extremely quick. Um, so it's done when it's done. You know, we only had money for five months, so <laughs> that's why you, that you have to be realistic there. I hope this was very useful for you guys. Thanks a lot for being here, and uh, I'll see you around. Good luck yeah. making games. Thank you, Adrian. We have a little gift for you, but that will come from you. Um, he's probably available for more questions and maybe we, you can just show your game to him because you know that's that's the way I guess <laughs> thank you very much uh, uh, for all your time and uh, see you in the stage uh, later on for the challenges again <laughs>